probably other. If you look to the, the issue of co-warranto, the, the, the constitutional provision relating to the ability to file an action for co-warranto speaks to superior court judges because it's a, that constitutional provision is limited to state officials, and superior court judges have been deemed to be those state officials for purposes of that action. So that's another basis for supporting the proposition that you're suggesting. The, the thing I was getting at a moment ago was the fact that legislators and, and people out there are not limited in their imagination. In the mid-1980s, there was a constitution, there was a statutory provision that Kerry Woodall, the state senator from, from Whatcom County, passed a provision that said you could not be a judge in Washington and also be a member of the military in any fashion or another. And as a consequence, that was directed at Eugene Cushing, who was a superior court judge in King County, who was also a high official in the Washington National Guard. Judge Cushing was compelled to resign his position on the National Guard in order to save his position on the superior court bench. Senator Irving Newhouse and I sponsored an amendment that eliminated that provision in order to allow Judge Rick Strokey on the Richmond County bench to run for office and Judge Pat Aiken in King County Superior Court to run for that position, both of whom had military connections at the time they were seeking the position. My point in raising this is it's not an idle threat that people can craft circumstances, eligibility requirements beyond those invoked in the Constitution to make it difficult for people to serve. We talked about the bare minimum qualifications that you're advancing under Section 17. Could the practice of electing superior court judges be changed to just have everyone in an open statewide election under Section 17? Under the Constitution, I think there's some, there's a reference made to the fact that they have to be elected by county. So I'm not sure that that would be a possibility. What do we make of the statutes that impose residency requirements for the district courts and the courts of appeals? Those are, those are within the constitutional authority of the legislature to do. Again, the legislature was cognizant, or the framers, excuse me, were cognizant of what they could give the legislature to do, what they could delegate to the legislature as their responsibility. So the framers of our Constitution delegated the responsibility for setting the qualifications for justices of the peace and for inferior courts in Articles 4, Sections 10 and 11 to the legislature. The legislature could set qualifications for those courts. In the Court of Appeals Constitutional Amendment in 1969, that authority was again conferred on the legislature to prescribe for the Court of Appeals residency requirements or anything else that the legislature chose to do. The framers didn't do that for the superior court or for this court. The specific language is not there that confers this authority, and the framers were more than cognizant of it, having done a residency requirement for the executive, for the legislature, having rejected it for this court, and having made clear that they could delegate those responsibilities to the legislature to deal with justices of the peace and others. Can we make anything of the fact that the legislature is aware of 4204020 and yet pass statutes that do impose limits on the district and appellate courts? It seems to me that if we read 4204020 as applying to all judges, I guess I'm just wondering if that's redundant or not. I think we can take something in the way of legislative acquiescence, Your Honor, out of the fact that the legislature had to be cognizant of this court's decisions in Marks, Nielsen, and Quick Rubin that made clear that residency requirements were not present for superior court judges, that the sole and exclusive requirement for the superior court of this court was admission to the bar, and the legislature did nothing. The legislature has had numerous opportunities to amend 4204020 and has not chosen to do so, nor has the legislature in the place that you would expect them to act, RCW Title II, and in particular RCW 208, has never enacted any kind of residency requirements or anything else for superior court candidates running for the superior court. So you have, I think, an argument of legislative acquiescence. Let me... Why do you suppose it's taken 120 years for this issue to get there? Candidly, Your Honor, I suspect that there are a number of circumstances where people have had interesting residency arrangements that have allowed them to continue in office. I was familiar with a number of those for legislators who had interesting post office box arrangements to be able to be residents of their district way back when in the day. I think it's probably something that's been handled in that way. Christine Schaller didn't do it that way. She was candid and upfront and believed that the voters should make this decision. The voters thought that it was vital to them that she be an actual physical resident of Thurston County, and the voters would make that choice. 
am Jim Johnson, and I want to correct one thing right away, and that is that I am not a disgruntled, unsuccessful candidate. I, in fact, was one of the two candidates nominated for the general election ballot. Um, I want to start by talking about what you were talking with council about on uh, RCW 4204020 and whether you can interpret that as, as setting a statewide residency requirement. Um, and the reason why that doesn't work is because of the, uh, the vacancy requirement. What we're talking about here is not some technical thing. We are talking about self-government. Washington understood about self-government because for 35 years, they were ruled from Washington, D.C.
Court is adjourned.